this talk will be about uh, file system and specifics of working with file system in time series databases. By scanning the QR code, you can get the online slide. Those slides contain links, so if you want to follow the links uh, during the presentation, you can just click on, on them. So yeah, feel free to scan. Um, I hope everyone scans if wanted. Uh, my name is Roman, I'm a software engineer with, um, I don't even remember, seven, eight years of experience. Um, and last few years I'm working on open source time series database called Victorometrics. Uh, you can follow me on GitHub or on Twitter. So in order to start this conversation, I, I, need, you, uh, I need to hook you up a bit and get your attention. So here's one discovery that uh, I recently made. I, I found a cool um, article on the Hacker News called Using Postgres for Everything. And this article suggests that uh, Postgres is so cool technology that you can basically use Postgres for everything uh, where you need a database. And you can do whatever you need only with Postgres. What is also cool is that there is another article on the Hacker News, uh, which was a bit earlier, about uh, how Postgres is enough for everything with the same, same intention, like suggesting that you can do uh, everything with Postgres. And also there was another article, just use Postgres for everything, again, with the same topic. And what is interesting here is that it's not a hype train, right? Postgres is not something new, it's like 30 old year technology. So uh, probably these uh, people are not hyping. They are pretty sure that you can do everything with Postgres. So, uh, but in reality, there are more than one database. Uh, actually, if you go to dbengines.com, a resource which maintains uh, like a ranking list for databases, it contains like more than 400 different databases for different purposes. And even what is more interesting, that people continue creating new databases. So probably they are not satisfied with Postgres 100%, and uh, there are some tasks where you need something else. And uh, let's start into databases with this simple example. So in my uh, understanding, the database is a software or hardware where I can put the data, the data will persist, and later I can request the data back and get it unchanged. I can also ask this database to update the data or delete the data, but the idea is that this document where I put description for this article, uh, for, for this talk, uh, it should be available even, even, even if I ask to show it like a year later. So it's a database in my understanding. Does it run Postgres? I don't know, but, uh, and I don't know uh, how Google Docs working internally, but we can make a few observations together. So uh, Google Docs has this cool feature called collaboration, uh, which means you can edit the same document together with other people in real time, which means other people can update the same sentences as you uh, update the same words, add words, delete words, etc. And for me as an engineer, this sounds like a pretty complicated task because like, like imagine you have 50 people in real time updating the same sentence and you have a lot of conflicts to resolve and you need to be very good and fast in resolving those conflicts. What else I observed? So um, when I put the data in the Google Doc, actually uh, it doesn't save every character every letter that I put. Uh, on, the, on this GIF I'm entering like 30, 40 characters, but uh, Google Docs actually issues seven save requests only. So um, what, it, what this means is that if my Chrome tab page crashes, I can lose the data. And this is uh, probably some workaround or uh, performance optimization from Google Docs uh, position. So they try to eliminate something some bottlenecks by batching these requests and making them periodically, like twice or thrice per second. So uh, what are the common bottlenecks that databases usually experience? Well, the first one is CPU, probably, the computational power which is used by databases to process the data, apply transformations, aggregations, calculate something. Uh, in case of Google Docs, it's probably resolving conflicts in real time. So one of the bottlenecks. Another one is disk, because databases uh, have durability promises. They need to put the data you enter on the, on the drives. They need to persist them. What else? Memory. 
memory is usually a bottleneck for modern databases especially uh, because they need to maintain all the indexes, all the caches, all this stuff. If you want your database to work fast, you want more RAM. Concurrent access. So uh, again, imagine if you have 2,000 people or um, just actors updating the same resource. Of course, you will have to serialize the access. You, you need to provide it um, without corrupting the data. So you will start queuing it. You will start introducing mutexes or something like that. And here you can have a bottleneck. Everything will become slow if you don't do this in a good manner. Indexing. So this is another bottleneck. So um, databases uh, use indexes for improving lookup speed. But what actually uh, indexing means that you need to create um, additional records when you ingest the data in the database. But the point of this talk is that, and my observation, that most of these limitations are actually related to the disks being slow. So because databases need to persist the data on the disk and do it in a durable manner, and because disks are slow, this is why your databases are usually slow. So um, how different databases solve the bottleneck uh, of disk speed? Well, uh, Traditional general purpose databases like Postgres or MySQL just provide you a bunch of settings that you can tune. For example, you can delay uh, durability promises like synchronize data every 10 seconds or something like that. There are databases which are called in-memory databases which try to not touch disk at all. Uh, for example, WallDB can store everything in memory. It is super fast. It will provide you like microsecond latency on read requests, but it also has disadvantages. It's expensive because you are limited now with the amount of memory you have on the instance. And also it has lower durability promises because if power goes off, everything that you had in memory will be lost. Columnar databases like uh, ClickHouse or Google BigQuery, uh, they uh, try to use different data structures. Uh, they still touch the disk, but they try to do it effectively. So if they touch the disk, they need to read like gigabytes of data at once. Uh, they are usually used for analytical purposes where you need to scan like a year of data as fast as possible. And there are also time series databases like Prometheus or Victoria Metrics, which are used for monitoring for uh, infrastructure monitoring, KPM monitoring, etc. And since I'm working on Victoria Metrics uh, at my day job, I will um, try to use it as example for working with Cloud. So uh, what makes time series databases different? Well, um, time series databases have different requirements to general purpose databases. So first, they have to survive huge ingestion rate because telemetry data is an endless stream of data. You can monitor everything. You can have thousands of your uh, instances of servers. All they have huge amount of metrics to expose and uh, this results in the huge ingestion rate. So here on the screen, you, you can see that um, we ingest like 17 million samples per second in the Victoria metrics. It's a, not a benchmark, it's production cluster. That's the volume of data we need to live with, we need to process with. On the other hand, the read load is much slower. Like we need to survive only hundreds of read requests per second. So we end up with uh, specifics of time series databases. You need to process big amounts of data. You need to be ingestion optimized. And what is also cool about time series data is that it is unlikely to change in the past because time series data are usually an observation. If you observe that temperature in this room is like 20 uh, degrees Celsius, it is unlikely that this value will change one hour later because you fix the reality. Reality doesn't change. so don't uh, time series data, which makes uh, time series databases usually append only databases, means they do not need to support update step, basically. So uh, we have, uh, we started with Postgres. Let's think how we can optimize Postgres for better ingestion. Well, we can open Postgres documentation and read performance tips, which we recommend to do the following, like disable triggers on the table, try to do batches. And some unrealistic recommendations like uh, drop your indexes and drop your foreign keys. 
but uh, these are usually recommendations to pre-populate in database. It can be done in, in real time, so uh, these recommendations will not help. But what, what can we, we can say that all these recommendations are um, directed to reducing I.O. amplification, like to, to touch this as less as possible. Um, so um, why we want to try uh, to touch disk as less as possible? Well, because it's slow. And um, uh, what is also interesting about the Postgres and all the databases that they usually provide durability promises. And uh, the quick history for you, for if you ever try to write a database or try to just persist anything with your application on the disk, write something into the file, uh, the quick theory. When you call uh, a syscall of write, it doesn't mean that uh, the data that you wrote into file will be actually persist. In fact, when you write something into file, it gets written into the operating system memory, and it resides there. If memory, if power goes off, you can lose the data, which resides currently in memory in the page cache. So, what databases usually do to survive this write, uh, to survive power uh, loss, they call a sync which is another uh, syscall, which makes sure that data actually reached the disk drive and not residing in the memory. Ideally, databases need to call AppSync after each data change operation. But the problem with AppSync is that is, it is super slow. So um, you can visit the link below where uh, people did some benchmarks about AppSync performance on different data drives and uh, on usual HDDs uh, with spinning disks, you can get as much like hundreds of AppSync per second, which means effectively that if you use HDDs, you can do more than 100 persistent durable transactions on your database. Of, of course, you can switch to SSDs, which are more expensive. So uh, we have just an average uh, Samsung SSD here, which provides like 300 AppSync per second and high-end enterprise grade Intel PC whatever, which gives you like seven, eight thousand of things per second. Which is cool, it is expensive, but it's still super slow. It's not near to 70 million. It's at max 10,000 transactions per second on this SSD. So what we can do with Postgres? Well, we can violate uh, durability promises. And Postgres block says that if you do not care about durability, of course you can follow these recommendations. So for example, you can turn Postgres into in-memory database by using memory baked file system. File system. You can disable write ahead log. You can disable AppSync log, which means the ingestion will be, will be much faster, but you will have the risk of data loss or data corruption in case of system crash or power off. What Victoria Metrics as a time series database does in this case to overcome this sync limitation? Well, we ingest data in the buffer, in the in-memory buffer, all those 70 millions goes into the memory buffer, and periodically, uh, once in a few seconds, or when buffer is full, we flush data on the disk with a sync command together to ensure that it was persisted. The data that we flush on the disk is called data part, and uh, it, uh, it comes in a SS table structure, which comes from LSM uh, structure of databases, if you want to Google that. Anyway, here's how it looks like. So we have this in-memory SS table where all writes are, are accepted. Uh, they form the data that we need to persist. And periodically, we call AppSync to put the data on the file system. And when it comes to the file system with AppSync, it is safe, even in case of power loss. But what's not uh, really good in this schema is that we can lose some data which resides in the memory. So we accepted some, some writes, we didn't call it sync yet, and we lose electricity, so everything that resides in memory will be lost. So um, that's the reality. What other databases do to overcome this limitation? Well, um, the common recommendation will be to use write-ahead log. And write-ahead log is a technique uh, which used by Postgres, by MySQL, by, by Prometheus, uh, by, I don't know, by Cassandra, by, by many databases. And it usually means that every data change operation is firstly recorded into write-ahead log, like a journal. Like, I'm, I will going to add a new row. 
So you put these records into write ahead log, and then you start to do the actual operation, which is not atomic and can be probably interrupted, but that's okay. When database start again, it reads the write ahead log. It sees that some operations were not completed. It repeats them. But does write ahead log get persisted to the disk immediately? Well, no, you need to call fsync again. If you update write ahead log, you need to call fsync. So basically, you end up with the same limitation. You can't call fsync frequently enough. So even if you have write ahead log, usually databases do not call it every time you change the data. So for example, Prometheus calls uh, fsync when only a bit, only chunk of data will be full to this data. So similar to the in-memory buffer. Cassandra will call write ahead log every 10 seconds. Uh, the outlier here is the Postgres. Postgres will call it uh, by default for every write. But uh, even then, if even if Postgres tries to play by the rules, it doesn't guarantee you that data will be saved. And uh, you, can, you can click on this link, and it's a full talk from the FOSDEM uh, previous year where, uh, about how Postgres used to sync incorrectly for 20 years. So uh, still with this approach, with this limitation, you can lose your data. So uh, knowing this, does it make sense to use write-ahead log at all? So if you want to, if for write-ahead log to work, you need to call it sync, but you can't call it sync because it has performance limitation. So you usually databases delay fsync calls, uh, which defeats the purpose of having write-ahead log. So what what the point of having this complex abstraction if you can just buffer data in the memory and persist it every few seconds? Can it get worse? Well, yes, because disk drives, uh, all the disk drives that we use, they also have write caches, which means even if uh, you put data on the disk and this operation returns you like, okay, I put the data on the disk, it doesn't mean that data was persisted. It can recite in the disk cache, write cache, and if uh, power will disappear, uh, all the in-cache in, in data can be lost. So, but as there are some full enterprise grade drives, which have capacitors, uh, and even if electricity goes off, they have enough energy to flush the disk, uh, to flush the data from the buffers on the disk. But the question is, do you use them? <laughs> maybe, maybe someone does, but uh, not everyone has this access to enterprise grade drives. Also, if sync kinda supposed to ensure that data goes directly to the disk, uh, not in the caches, but in reality, uh, this uh, promise will be implemented by the disk drive manufacturer, and uh, not, it, it can be controlled by operating system. So if you, again, if you click on the article below, you can find that during the test, there was one cheap disk, like $50 disk, which was faster than everything else uh, for some reason, well, because it, uh, <laughs> because it didn't play by the rules. So uh, summary about uh, not losing data uh, and about durability promises. Well, uh, the ingestion of per uh, performance ingestion of databases is limited exactly by durability promises they provide. The lower our promises, the faster is performance. F-sync operation, which gives you these durability promises, is very slow. So uh, different databases trying to delay uh, F-sync call do the batched F-sync call or just do not call it at all and rely on the operating system to do that instead of them. And also, be, uh, the common techniques of having uh, write ahead log to persist the data to make sure you not do not lose everything doesn't work if you don't call it sync every time. And as you see, most databases don't do that. Okay, what could be worse than losing the data? Like data corruption is the worse than losing the data. So, what it means, uh, data corruption? That's when you try to do um, some non-atomic operation, which take time, and you was interrupted in the middle. So in result, you can end up with partially written data or with partially deleted data. Like for example, you started to write 100 meg file, you was interrupted in the middle, you have 50 megs only written on the disk. If data was encoded, you won't be able even to decode it back. So it makes no sense in having this data. It's a bad situation. You can corrupt your data. And the same with deleting data. Imagine you're deleting a directory with 100 files inside. 
you uh, operating system will do it, deleting it one by one. If it was interrupted in the middle, some files could be deleted, some not. Again, partial state. Does it affect Victoria metrics in this case? Well, yes, because Victoria metrics needs to create, delete, and modify files in this. Uh, for example, it deletes data which comes out of reten retention, data part uh, out of retention, and it also has to do background merge process. Why it needs to do background merge process? Well, because storing uh, every few seconds of the data as a separate file or separate folder is not efficient. So in order to reduce the amount of files that we store on the disk, we need to merge multiple files into one part, which reduces the number of files that we have on disk, and also significantly improves compression. So uh, this is cool technique and we need to do this, but what will happen if we get interrupted in the merge processes? So on the screen you can see how the merge actually looks like. So we have some data part located on the file system and we have a background process which looks on the part that it can merge. Then it reads those parts in the memory and creates a new part, part with a new name, and it puts the sorted, reordered, and recompressed data in that part. After it's finished, this process goes to the uh, special file called parts.json, which is kind of registry of currently active parts, currently searchable parts, and it removes from there those first two parts which were merged together because we don't need them anymore, and adds a new part which it just created. So we end up with removing two old parts and creating a new optimized part. So what will happen if we get a power loss in the middle of merge process? Well, uh, we can have partially written new part, which will contain only fraction of the data, not the full one. We can also end up with inconsistent parts JSON. We started to update it. Update operation is not atomic. If we got interrupted in the middle, it can be inconsistent. And removing data part, again, as, yes, as I said, uh, you could be like end up with half files deleted. What we can do with that, knowing that write operation and uh, update operation aren't atomic. Well, we can find for something which is atomic in the uh, Linux kernel, and it is a rename uh, syscall. And rename promises us atomicity. So uh, what we do with the rename syscall? Well, just it's example in the Go code, which we use internally uh, for function called must write atomic. So how it works? Let's imagine we need to update parts JSON to remove two old parts and add a new part. What we do, we create a temporary uh, file, like parts, temporary, something, JSON. We do all the modifications there. We call fsync, and if fsync returns us true, means everything was persistent, we do atomic call by renaming it. We renaming it by uh, point into the original part JSON, this operation is atomic, we either end up with renaming it with replacing this file or not. If we replace the file, we are consistent, all cool, uh, operation succeeded. If we didn't, well, we lost uh, just the merge result. So when process starts next time after power off, we will start a new merge and that's all. But still, we are in consistent state. We don't have a data corruption. We just might lost like a few seconds of the data process. So uh, what are data safety guarantees of the background merge process? Well, merging can be interrupted right in the middle, even with power off, and that's okay. Victoria metrics can survive that. On the process start, when Victoria metrics start after the power off, it checks if there are any temporary files left, and it deletes them. And it also checks the parts JSON file, and if it, if it founds um, some parts that are not listed in this file, it also deletes them because they are not, probably they were not finished, and that's okay, we are not losing any data, because original data parts are still there. So we don't have corruption on merge, we don't have corruption on deletion, and uh, our database is always consistent even if we experience the power off situation. Okay, how to atomically uh, remove directory? So we have another function called must remove directory atomic, and what we actually do with this directory, we schedule it for deleting by, again, calling the syscall uh, rename. So 
basically we're renaming it to the new name by adding some suffix. In our case, we add must remove suffix, and that's all. Once we did this, this uh, folder is not more searchable, and it is scheduled for deletion. Then we try to delete it, and if deletion didn't succeed because of the power off or something like that, on the next process start, we will still see that some directories have this suffix and they need to be deleted, so we will schedule deleting again, and it will be eventually deleted. Okay, uh, some users use Vectorometrics with NFS, which is also uh, a new challenge because NFS is a network file system, which means you don't uh, deal only with uh, different disk drives, but you also need to deal with network. And what happens with the network is that it's also not reliable at all and it's also different kind of I.O. So many users reported that sometimes files can be deleted consistently uh, when they use NFS and that prevents Victorometrics from working correctly. And usually those um, operations of deleting are not succeeding because NFS returns you like, um, this resource is busy, or a temporary network error, or something like that. So what we do, uh, this function must remove all from the previous slide. What it actually tries to do, it goes by the fast path by trying to remove it as, as in a normal way, just calling delete all. But if it didn't succeed, we schedule the deletion in the background by running a goroutine. And this goroutine will try deleting over and over and over until it succeeds to delete the file eventually. You can check the context, context about the user actual problems and how we solved it in the, this GitHub issue uh, and the communication we had with users. And right now, uh, NFS is okay uh, for working with Victorometrics. It's still not as good as like using something like S4, but still. You can live with that. Okay, um, instant backups. So we learned that time series data never change. We learned that we do not mutate data parts ever. We either create them or delete them. There is like no intermediate process where we have unfinished part which is, which is searchable. Okay. So uh, this means that our data folder is always in inconsistent state. So how can we make instant backup of this data folder using a hard link. So for those who are not familiar with hard links, it's a, a specific type of instant Linux system which can uh, create a link which points to original file in the file system. And this link is, um, for a user, it is undistinguishable for, from original file. So if you have two hard links pointing to one original file, for user, they, they are just like two files. but those two files do not occupy extra space. If you made a hard link, it doesn't mean that uh, you still like see uh, the data folder as a full backup, but it doesn't occupy any space because it just points to original file. Uh, what also cool, if original files get deleted, this hard link becomes the original file in the Linux system. So even if we delete some data parts after background merges, the backup will be consistent. It will not see the new part, but it will have the old part. And also hard links are created instantly. Like you can, it's, a, it's a, just a matter of a second to create the full backup in regard of the disk size. Like you can create a hard link for one terabyte of data in one second and do whatever you want with that. Okay, so um, a quick summary based on these observations uh, for working with file system. So from my perspective, there is no silver bullet database to solve every problem. There is uh, no one right answer. It is very likely that specialized databases will do with specific problems more efficiently. And what is even more uh, better is that you don't need to configure them explicitly to do this. So they are likely easier to use and easier to maintain for specific tasks. These corporations are the main bottleneck for the modern databases right now and um, the performance of the database right now depends only on what durability promises you provide. And yes, providing this durability has very great cost because a sync operation is super small uh, in modern operating systems. If you're curious about resources I used for this uh, presentation, you can visit these links. Again, everything is available by uh, checking the QR code. And uh, yes, I encourage you to to check them because um, 
I will, which was really interesting for me to investigate. Okay, uh, that's all. And uh, <laughs> any questions? Um, how does uh, Victoria handle uh, parallel requests for read and write? Is that a problem that you guys face? No, because of the nature of time series databases, you don't have updates, so you can. Oh have, right, okay. You have only writes, means you do not compete for resource. Mm, okay, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So my question is like. How does Victoria Metrics compare against other databases like key value stores like RocksDB or LevelDB? Because I understand like RocksDB, um, the main advantage is like multi-threaded compactions. I'm pretty sure, and just by listening to your talk, I think Victoria Metrics does use LSM trees, and I believe you guys are building it from scratch, right? Using the concept of LSM trees. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, did you do any like benchmark comparisons against other key value stores? So uh, in the first place, Victorometrics is not a key value store. Uh, it's a time series database, so there is no point in uh, comparing it to RocksDB. RocksDB serves a different purpose. Yes, it is right that it is written from scratch in Go without uh, using any extra databases. Everything was written in the scratch. And yes, Victorometrics also can do um, multi-threading compression in the background because those data parts, they're immutable and isolated. You can run whatever threads or threads to compact as many parts as you want, right? And this is how it works right now. Depending on the amount of CPU cores, Victorometrics can run the limited number of parallel threads for compaction. If you have eight cores, it will run eight threads for compaction. And the same for reads and the same for writes. And we have a lot of uh, benchmarks with uh, similar databases. So you mentioned TimescaleDB, DB, which I'm semi familiar with from pre COVID days when I was at All Things Open and they actually did a walkthrough of that. And I was like, oh, that's interesting because in one of the services that I help out on, we deal with cost management data coming from like the cloud. So it's time series data, but it's not in terms of like high high input rights, if that makes sense. It's more ETL data. So I'm just interested in kind of like what are the differences between the two and, and the value from Victoria Metrics that you gain? Yeah, so the question was how Victoria Metrics is different to Timescale DB. And for those who are not familiar, Timescale DB is actually a time series database built on top of Postgres. They actually provide an extension for Postgres for time series data. And they promise to do that efficiently. The difference between uh, Timescale DB and Victoria Metrics is that Victoria Metrics is schemaless. You don't need to define tables. You don't need to think about compression. You don't need to think about indexes. All this is managed automatically. While in Timescale DB, you need to define the schema. You need, you need to think in advance of what your data will be. Another difference is that Timescale DB kind of supports updates. Uh, well, Victoria Metrics doesn't support updates. But again, in Timescale DB, it comes with a price. If you want updates, you, you have to disable compression. If you disable compression, Timescale DB consumes like 80 times more data than Victoria Metrics for the same data set. If you enable compression, you lose the update. And also, Timescale DB had uh, tried to compete with uh, Victoria Metrics and other databases in similar in infrastructure and APM monitoring by, using, uh, by introducing the open source product called PromScale, but that didn't work out. After uh, two years, they have to close it, and now they moved specifically to IoT segment, and they usually provide services and sell timescale DB to IoT companies. So that's the difference. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you for attending. <laughs>